Get a pen and paper because today's episode is going to be a doozy. We will be talking about molting and I will be using a lot of scientific terminology in this one. Just a few days ago, I was lucky enough to catch my Acanthoscuria geniculata molting. I caught her, turned out to be him actually, I caught him flipping over just shortly after it started, so I got the entire thing on film. So it kind of set the stage for this episode, didn't it? I had something else planned, but that's going to be put off until next week. First things first, let's talk about what molting actually is. Absolutely all arthropods go through this, everything from lobsters to roaches to caterpillars. Formally, molting is called ectasis, and it is the sole way any arthropod can get larger, as I've already said. Every arthropod does this routinely to number one, heal themselves, we'll talk about that in a moment, to grow, like I just covered, and to reach sexual maturity so that they can actually pass on their genes to the next generation. Molting actually involves the removal of the entire old exoskeleton. Now, this has a huge benefit in the sense that it allows them to regrow limbs, heal wounds, and just generally tune themselves up. In the case of tarantulas, they get to regrow all of those urticating setae I spoke about last time. By the end of the molting process, the tarantula is enclosed in its new exoskeleton, and the old discarded exoskeleton is no longer an exoskeleton. It's then called an exuvia. Plural would be exuviae. Exuvium is not a word. All right, so from beginning to end, there will be three stages in all of this. Pre-molt, molt, and post-molt. We're gonna go over those one at a time, of course. During the early stages of pre-molt, you may not even know your spider is going through these changes. It is developing the new exoskeleton underneath the old one, so for a time they actually have two exoskeletons. You can start to see this old exoskeleton later on in the form of a very darkening abdomen, and during the absolute last stages of pre-molt, the entire spider will be dark. By the time you notice this darkening, you will probably also notice that your spider is very lethargic. Not really moving, it might be in weird positions every now and then, uh, it just won't be acting itself and a lot of new keepers believe it to be sick. Quite the opposite, it's doing very well, you just need to leave it alone and stop prodding it. After a certain point, they will flat out refuse food. They won't take food anymore. They essentially know that they have enough to make it through the molt. This is going to be a very traumatic experience for them. You'll see that in a moment. Um, so they just need some alone time to do what they need to do. You'll also notice that many arboreal species, the tree climbing species, will lose their ability to stick to smooth surfaces such as glass. Their climbing ability on wood will be unhindered because they have tarsal claws, but the actual pads won't work quite as well. Regardless of species, many of them will actually close up their retreat, whether it's a cork tube or a terracotta pot or what have you. They'll put up dirt curtains, they'll web it closed. They don't want to put on a show. They want to be away from everything. This is the most fragile that the spider will ever be. They can extremely easily die during this time. So again, they want to be left alone. During the absolute last stages of pre-molt, very specialized digestive enzymes and lubrication fluid will be um, secreted between the epidermis and the old exoskeleton. This will help them squeeze out of their old exoskeleton, which you'll see here in just a moment. Now comes the interesting part, the action, the part where they actually molt. During this time, please leave them alone. I even debated not filming my Aegeniculata because I didn't want to bother her. Leave the room. If it's an option, turn off the lights. Leave it alone. Not on all species and not on all individuals, but often directly before a molt. We're talking right before they flip over. They might do two things. More commonly, they will lay a web mat, just put a whole layer of webbing where they're going to molt. This keeps them up off the dirty, possibly sharp ground, and it also deters ants from finding them. In the case of many New World species, the ones that are capable will actually kick off a lot of urticating setae to create an actual carpet of pain. 
In case you didn't watch the last episode about urticating Cite, it essentially is very, very itchy hair. It ranges from itchy to burning. All right, so here we go with the actual molt. At this point, most spiders, the vast majority of them, will flip over onto their back. Upright molts are not unheard of, but it's pretty uncommon and complications can arise. Not necessarily, but they can. The absolute first thing you'll see is the cap of the carapace completely popping off because that is the only way that it's going to get out of that old exoskeleton. It will create wave-like motions over and over and over for hours to slowly force itself out of the old exoskeleton. A lot of the time, that pulsating motion that I referred to is extremely difficult to see in real time. That's why I sped this video up. It is extremely slow, but you can see them making progress if you stand around long enough. When the process is done, their new exoskeleton will very quickly begin to harden. They are extremely fragile and squishy. If you were to touch them, don't touch them at this point. Once that new exoskeleton is hardened, they're essentially done. Your job as a keeper is not done, we'll go over that in a moment, but they are essentially done. They will remain lethargic for a while because again, they are still weak. This is the equivalent of you or I going through major surgery. So again, leave them alone. Last stage, post-molt. Even though the spider is now quite a bit larger and even the day after its full colors are now in, it is still very, very weak. It will contort itself into very strange positions, cleaning itself, maybe on its side. It might look like it's in distress, but it's not. The worst of it's over, the storm has passed, let it do its thing. Concerning being fragile, they will be very hungry after this molt. Their abdomen will be quite small for obvious reasons. However, resist the urge to feed, please. You certainly want to err on the side of caution with this one. As I've brought up before, tarantulas can survive a very long time without food, and this is no different. Personally, my rule of thumb, if the spider is larger than two inches, I wait at least three weeks before feeding. Yes, three weeks. I didn't misspeak. For larger spiders, four inches plus, I wait at least a month, sometimes longer. I want to err on the side of caution here. If they eat too early after molting, their fangs can break. Both of them. If both of their fangs break, you will very likely have a dead spider in the long run. Before I get on to what's expected of you as a keeper during this time, I'm going to go over some extra notes, some fun little tidbits. In spiders specifically, every visible aspect is molted. The eyes, the fangs, the mouth, obviously the legs. But more interesting, including the sexual organs. This is actually the only way to positively sex a spider. That's why I said earlier, oh hey, my agent Aguilata turned out to be a male. He doesn't have the girl parts that you would look for on a molt. Like I've brought up more times than I can really count during this video, they are extremely fragile. I've brought it up, I believe in my first video, that a stray feeder worm can kill a molting tarantula, a cricket can kill a tarantula, just about anything can kill a tarantula during molting. Again, leave it alone, put it in a dark room, make sure there are no feeders whatsoever in that cage. This one you might have already seen coming. The smaller the specimen, the quicker the molt. The smallest slings can complete the entire process in about half an hour if they want to. The larger specimens can take over a day. Anything approaching two days, however, might be cause for concern. What can go wrong? Why should you be concerned? Well, the issue is that if a spider does not do this quickly enough, the new exoskeleton will harden inside of the old one. They will be permanently stuck, and there is virtually no hope for the spider at that point. If this happens, the spider is as good as dead. There are videos on YouTube of people trying to remove a tarantula from the old exoskeleton. I haven't seen a video where it succeeded. Personally, if this were to happen to me, it has happened to me, I put the spider out of its misery. If you ignored every other part of this video, here's the part where you need to pay attention. What is expected of you as a keeper? Take a wild guess what I'm about to say first. Leave it alone. These spiders have been doing this for millions of years, much longer than humans have been around. They got this. Leave it alone. 
the only thing that you can really do is maintain their environment. If it's a humid species, maybe keep it a constant humidity. Don't let it dry out like you might do in other times, like I do, I admit that. Keep a full, clean water dish at all times. Don't be afraid to change the water dish if they're still in pre-molt, no matter how heavy the pre-molt. However, once they start molting, don't do anything. Leave them alone. Concerning the water, they will become extremely dehydrated during this process. One of the first things that a tarantula will do once they harden up is go take a nice long drink of water. On some of them, you can even see the abdomen fill up quite a bit. Spiders tend to not molt during the winter, but it is certainly not unheard of for them to molt during the winter. If you live in a particularly cold area and it's the winter, maybe run a space heater, run centralized heating, something. Do not point the heater at the enclosure. Passive heating. Before the molt and after, the spider will be lethargic for weeks. A lot of new keepers tend to poke and prod the spider, seeing if they're all right, seeing if they have the same reaction that they did a month ago. They won't, and they're fine. Now I'm sure you will be anxious to get the old exuvia out of there. Some people pin them, some people keep them. I like to keep the fangs. However, wait until the spider does it for you. They will actually throw it away. The same place that they put their boluses, the old food, the same place that they poop, Wherever they do that, it's usually in a corner of an enclosure, you'll eventually find the molt there. It's garbage to them. So that's actually about it. That's the whole process of molting. If you believe anything to be out of the ordinary, because of course I can't cover absolutely every aspect of molting, please visit arachnoboards.com. It is a very helpful resource full of people that have years of experience in this. We get at least one posting a week of people asking for help on a molt. Nine times out of ten, it's nothing, but it's better to be safe than sorry. I used that molting video as an educational tool throughout this video, but if you'd like to see the full version, I will be uploading that as a separate video as soon as it's done rendering. A five-hour video takes a very long time to render down. Unfortunately, I kind of messed up filming it. About half of it is out of focus in the beginning, but luckily, once the real action starts, I did get it in focus. Thankfully for that one. And that's about it for this episode. As always, if you have any questions whatsoever, please feel free to ask in the comments. I will always reply. Don't forget to subscribe for, again, hopefully weekly videos. That's my goal. As always, this has been Araniade. I've been Oilers K, and thank you once again for watching.